Welcome to today's webinar, Delivering Trusted Customer Experiences with Adaptive Access Control, hosted by SecureAuth and Forrester Research. Uh, my name is Robert Block. I'm the Senior Vice President of Identity Strategy at SecureAuth. I've been in the identity industry uh, since about 2000. Um, I've held numerous roles and numerous leadership roles uh, on the consulting side, on the implementation side, and also on the solution provider side. Uh, along with me today, I'm joined by Merrick Maxim, Principal Analyst serving security and risk professionals at Forrester. Merrick covers identity management and access management, including user provisioning, access governance, customer IAM, IDAS, SSO, and IoT security. His research builds on 20 years of experience helping security leaders at global enterprises derive optimal business value from their IAM initiatives. So with that, I'll turn it over to Merritt, and uh, we'll get started. Thanks, Robert, and good afternoon or good morning to those of you who are joining. Uh, appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your day to learn a little bit more about this topic. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, the next 20 minutes or so kind of studying the stage, uh, kind of giving you some market perspectives from uh, what we at Forrester see in our interactions with clients across uh, all verticals and all geographies, and then uh, I'll turn it back over to Robert, who'll talk a little bit more specifically about uh, how Secure Auth addresses some of these challenges, and then um, uh, as he indicated, we will uh, allow for uh, time at the conclusion to actually go into the um, uh, Q&A. So uh, looking forward to, to uh, continuing that discussion. So as the, uh, this, this kind of concept of trusted digital experiences is something that uh, we've actually done a fair amount of work and research around over the last really two years. And a lot of this is driven around kind of our own uh, personal interactions with sites and things that we use on a daily basis for uh, personal use, not necessarily for business use. And I think all of this can probably relate to uh, uh, websites or, or mobile apps that we think do a, a good job of kind of engaging with the user but doing it in a way that is um, kind of security appropriate. And that's kind of what we mean when we talk about uh, trusted digital experiences, uh, but it is still uh, a, a challenge that organizations are, are facing and we want to talk a little more about what we kind of in, in mean by that. So I, I start these presentations with our, our kind of usual um, uh, good example of CAPTCHA, which has uh, kind of become a poster child for something that provides a lot of security value in the form of getting rid of uh, stopping bots or other fraudulent activity, but it does it in perhaps a, a less than user-friendly manner. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen, this is actually kind of CAPTCHA part two or, or the reCAPTCHA or image CAPTCHAs that have started to emerge on websites in the last really a year or so, and this actually is a, is a live example that I've encountered here where the option here is instead of trying to type in the, the squiggly text, uh, you have to select all the images with T. Now that seems like a fairly straightforward exercise until you look at that item in the lower left. Um, that looks like coffee, but is it a tea latte or some kind of tea-based drink? As a user, I'm presented with a challenge, do I check the box? Hope I get it right, in which case I can go ahead, or do I check it, uh, I'm wrong, uh, I have to go through this process again, or I don't check it and I'm wrong and I get the same scenario. Um, but this is a kind of example of these types of uh, issues that can be very frustrating to end users and actually cost you and your organization money, either in the form of users calling your support desk to ask for password assistance, or more significantly, users decide that they're going to go uh, take their business somewhere else. They're going to buy their product somewhere else because um, the online process is just too cumbersome for them. And this, this is the, the good news is we've, we've made considerable improvement, and in, in, in I think we've moved away from the days of these kind of multi-part uh, web forms here. This is kind of an exaggerated example, but many of us have probably been through that scenario where we have to answer lots of questions just to create an account to more or less check out and purchase something online, and that can be kind of a frustrating experience. Uh, sites in, uh, in, in general have gotten better at moving away from these processes, but they do still persist out there, and when we encounter them, they do create real challenges for us. And, and if we kind of go back to the capture perspective, I have a couple of data points. This is from a Stanford University study. It's a few years old now, but I think it's still fairly uh, relevant for this kind of type of discussion. Um, in their study, they provided the same uh, capture. In this case, it was a text capture, not an image capture, to a, a group of users, and they asked them to, you know, ask, say, what's the text in the box? And only 71% of the time, 
could the people in those groups agree what the text was in the box? And I think we've all probably encountered this, you know, is that a O or a zero? Is that a three or a seven? What are the, you know, as the text get more and more compressed in a CAPTCHA, it gets harder and harder to ascertain uh, what the text is. Um, and I think the second more significant one is that they, uh, in their tests, which again, we're in a, a controlled environment, they said that it took almost 10 seconds for users to actually complete a capture function. Uh, and you can just think about that, kind of counting in to 10 in your head of how long that actually is while you're in front of a screen trying to actually do a transaction. It's actually a, it's a fairly long pause and it's a fairly uncomfortable pause. And the more, the longer the pause is or the more frequent the pause is, the, the more frustrating the user experience is. And so this just kind of confirms that while captures provide a lot of value and are used in a lot of instances, they do create challenges. And, and I have a couple of large uh, B to C e-commerce vendors that talk with me probably about every six or nine months. And their general question is, have you seen anything that will allow us to replace CAPTCHA because our users hate it and our business hates it? And so this continues to be a, a challenge for organizations. And what this is all really getting at is this concept of what we call friction, right? Where friction is the enemy in the sense that the more steps you put in front of a user, um, the more friction you create, and the more friction the user has, uh, the user's tolerance for wanting to pursue that transaction will likely be reduced. Uh, and they, again, they may decide to take your business elsewhere. So the question for a challenge for companies is, and tying back to the you know theme of this presentation, you know, we talk about adaptive access control. You know, ultimately it's about providing access control in a way that uh, provides the right level of friction, but not too much and not too little. And that's a real challenge for a lot of organizations today. At the same time, you know, as I kind of alluded to, this friction is actually costing organizations money. It's costing you money on twofold. It's increasing your cost because you're having to spend more effort to staff and man support desks to deal with past related calls. And it's also costing you money in the form of lost customers or uh, less loyal customers that don't feel as positive about your brand because the login process is too challenging and they're gonna go elsewhere. The second one's a little bit harder to model from a ROI perspective, but certainly from the password um, you know, we all know that that is a, a common uh, issue and it's a, a fairly significant cost for very large P2C organizations. So this issue of friction uh, creates challenges. And the other part of, of friction, which we haven't really talked about, is if you don't have enough friction, in other words, if you make it too easy to sign up for accounts, you also now expose yourself to fraud in the form of users who can create fraudulent accounts and what they will then do is um, uh, fill up a shopping cart and then uh, try to purchase things you, you, and enter a, a wide range of stolen credit card numbers to see and use that process to determine which cards are actually still valid and which are not. Uh, and again, that, there's a burden to your business on processing those and also sorting through those. So there's a, a fraud aspect that comes along by not having enough friction in place. And again, if you, if you look at this kind of analogy here, you can think of it in the traditional, you know, combust, internal combustion engine, right? Every engine needs some form of lubrication, oil or other things to keep parts running correctly. Uh, but just as um, engine performance, say, in your car can suffer if you have too little oil, it can also suffer if you have too much oil. And so you can think of this analogy around customer friction as understanding what's the right level of what you can provide. If you ask for too much information, your users will uh, probably opt out. If you don't ask for enough, you increase the risk of fraud. And so this does create some real challenges to figuring out what, what the ideal scenario is. And what this is all leading to is that, you know, trusted digital experience is about balance. And there is no perfect balance that applies equally to every company in the world. Every customer and every company is slightly uh, different and unique. And so you need to understand what kinds of access control or authentication policies are appropriate for users and apply those uh, and to build that right level of balance. And the other thing to be aware of is that that balance is continually shifting. Um, I think an argument you made that because of the continued high profile data breaches that we've witnessed uh, and continue to witness, whether it's Equifax or others, users are more aware about security issues than they have been in the past. And so the argument can be made that users are actually moving a little bit more towards wanting 
a little bit more friction as part of the authentication process because of concerns around data theft and identity theft and things like that. Um, that I think we don't have a way to kind of quantify that, but as users become more and more aware of security issues, um, you can just assume that what was a good level of friction, you know, six months ago, it still applies today. And so you need to be kind of continually assessing this on an ongoing basis. You know, and this is to that point about users having a high level of um, security concerns. This is some year-to-year -year data from our um, customer, North American customer technographics data, where we actually look at what's the user uh, behavior around both, say, tracking of behavior, uh, as well as how data could be accessed, and then also um, uh, who would access your data. And we see a fairly strong jump year over year across all those categories. Now, on one hand, you could interpret that saying, well, that's generally negative. Users are more and more concerned about uh, their online interactions and the data protections, which is true. But the, the inverse of that is that as users become more aware of that, there is now an opportunity for users to be more engaged and uh, more willing to um, uh, use services or product that they believe are doing a better job at actually protecting your data. So this is where we start to get into this kind of concept of, you know, privacy as a potential differentiator, and if sites can show they do a good job of that, uh, customers will likely choose those over sites that don't. And what's also happening as kind of in, in relation to this friction issue from our survey data is that the security team is increasingly being engaged uh, with their CX counterparts to actually understand how to build out an optimal customer experience. They're no longer, you know, being uh, you know, left out of this discussion. So as we actually look at, you know, adaptive access control, whenever we're talking about a, a B2C uh, website you know, or something like that, you do need to have your security team in got involved in these discussions. And this data shows that almost half of the security Security decision makers are getting involved in discussions around uh, customer experience, which is a generally a positive thing. You know, at the same time, it's just another point, you know, when we start talking about uh, authentication or registration processes, this is where things like, you know, what about using a Facebook or Google or an Instagram or LinkedIn identity to allow the user to pre-register the site? And there's certainly uh, value in that from a friction standpoint. It allows the user to more quickly and easily sign up for services. Um, but we also see at the same time increased concerns around what are the privacy and security considerations around that, not as much from the site that accepts the social identity is more from the social identity provider itself. In other words, if I use a social identity to access a site now, does that social identity provider now have information about the sites I use, and then will that therefore mean that I expect to see ads from that site in my news feed at that social identity provider or other scenarios like that? And so this just reflects, um, you know, the ongoing concerns around social media. We're not getting away from social media, but there are concern, continued customer concerns around usage of it. So kind of that as a, as a backdrop for kind of what, you know, the trusted digital experience and, and that concept behind that, I wanted to spend a few more minutes talking about the kind of customer identity access management market as a whole and what some of the key trends that are driving that space right now. Uh, you know, first and foremost goes out saying data breaches are, are a major concern, you know, whether it's uh, things like Equifax where we saw, you know, senior managers have to resign or lose their jobs over it. That continues to make boards aware of this and, and asking much more pointed questions about what are their protections and how well are they protecting and securing their customer data. And this creates some, some real challenges uh, uh, for organizations as well as opportunities to use this awareness to actually go for funding and actually work on building out more secure online experiences to help better protect uh, information. You know, at the same time, you know, we have Forrester have been talking about for a few years this kind of concept of the age of the customer, where we're in this kind of middle of a, of a macroeconomic cycle where customers are you know, more empowered than ever in terms of their access to information about products and services or pricing. And so, you know, if they can find something, uh, equivalent product at a better price somewhere else, so they may frequently do that. And that creates some real challenges uh, for businesses in terms of designing services that are customer friendly, but uh, give them the information they want to remain competitive. The challenge is, is that while the customers are empowered, uh, so are your hackers, and they have the same level of um, access to information, and therefore they can take advantage of that, whether it's through simple things like social engineering or password uh, uh, cracking, but you have to still be aware that the 
uh, you know, hacker sophistication continues to increase and you are still, you know, need to be aware of the potential for them to come, come and compromise your environments and, and steal data, or in some cases, they may even just stay resident in your environment for a period of time to do reconnaissance and then use that information to come back at a later date to actually perpetrate a, a more specific attack against a specific asset. You know, at the same time, you know, one thing that comes through clear when we talk with uh, CISOs is that, you know, today CISOs face a wide range of security initiatives, and this creates some real challenges from a staffing and budgetary standpoint. And again, if we look at, you know, what, what is considered a critical high priority here, we see lots of things listed here, most of which will not be able to fund all of them equally in the same year, so they do have to make priorities, but we see things like the customer experience, improving security of customer th uh, facing assets and other um, type scenarios just, just reflects that this is a challenging world that CISOs have to uh, deal with and uh, ultimately customer facing assets or things that directly relate to customers generally get higher priority than those that don't. And so when we actually look at a, like a, a, a customer and access management offering, really what these are about is trying to deliver uh, some security features but combine that with other data and insights that can feed into other systems in the business to give you a more clear view of an identity. So whether it's the understanding the, the access that that user has, um, how they're uh, accessing your environment, what types of devices they're using, what kind of browser they're using, uh, but then also what are they looking at in the site? How can we personalize the site? How can we recommend products to them based on the information we have about them? And so once I understand who that identity is, I can then take that information and use it in other uh, systems, in, in intro system to drive a better understanding of my customer that can then lead to a much more personalized experience for those users. You know, and at the same time, you know, enterprises are taking on more risk. Anytime they're capturing more data, there's risk now that that data is toxic and re represents a potential threat uh, that hackers may try to exploit. Now, the, which is, that's not a reason to stop collecting the data. It just means that, um, you know, an IM offering can uh, better help manage both the access to the data, but providing the kind of uh, policies and control in place to ensure that uh, not only the users but also the administrators and the people who are managing this data um, are viewing it in an appropriate manner and that there's no, uh, you know, you decrease the likelihood of inadvertent or, or other types of uh, misuse of uh, customer data. This just shows some uh, some survey data from uh, from last year. Again, we show a strong level of interest from enterprises planning to adopt customer and management, and also see uh, a very high uh, rating around improving the security of customer facing services or application as being a a higher critical priority. And these are all things that an identity access management offering can help uh, deliver upon. Also, it's worth noting, if you haven't figured out already, that, you know, when we talk about customer identity, it comes in many forms. Obviously, it can come in the physical form of someone who's actually in your store or retailer uh, in making a purchase. It can also take the more anonymous forms, like an actual just a cookie that indicates that they've been to your site, or it may actually be a, an authenticated user on your site that they've created an account, and they're using the mobile app, um, they purchase products from you, but the point is that the the uh, granularity uh, and the uh, of each component here may vary, and one of the challenges for organization is how do I merge all these uh, into a single view of the customer? So, you know, the user may be using a mobile browser, they switch to the mobile app, then they're on the desktop, then they go to the store to purchase something, they use their rewards card. How do you link all that together? It's actually a very challenging problem that organizations kind of struggle with and, and leads to this kind of concept of, of identity resolution. Uh, so how do I um, understand who the, who the real identity is here and ultimately can build a profile against that. And the problem gets e even worse when you start thinking about mergers and acquisitions when companies acquire each other, whether they're in competitive or complementary spaces, they need to understand what is the overlap between these two uh, customer bases and how do we go through and verify uh, and remove the duplicates so, you know, going forward, the user doesn't have to have two separate accounts for, for two separate brands. Um, again, it's a, it's a problem that over organizations face in particularly in very large scale BSC environments can be a real challenge. Again, just showing you some regional differences here. Uh, you know, again, the strong adoption really across all regions and I think that will only continue. So we got, you know, 
close it up before I turn it back over to Rob. You know, one of the things to think about when you're looking at a customer and access manager offering, it's important to understand your customer. Uh, this relates to things like, is it a very mobile-oriented use case, in which case should you be spending more time on the device and the mobile app, or is it more desktop-oriented? What are the demographics? Again, um, you know, younger uh, demographic is generally more mobile-aware than one that is not. Uh, and then you understand what is this balance, right, what we talked about with the trusted digital experiences, how do you balance that usability and security in a meaningful manner, and then also you need to understand um, scale. Uh, scale takes two forms. One is the ability for uh, a site to handle high volumes of usage, uh, but the other thing, there's an impact there from a user experience standpoint. If the site crashes, that's a very negative experience. And we're literally a week away from uh, Black Friday here in the U.S., which is a large uh, shopping day, uh, just kind of start off the holiday shopping season. Um, there have been instances in the past of sites that have not been able to handle the load and have crashed, and that's a very negative experience. So when you look at this on the customer side, scale is a very important aspect because just like usability, if the site doesn't perform well, users are likely to uh, to, uh, to go elsewhere. And again, the, the goal here right, is how do I move from uh, taking what is an anonymous user on my site or digital property and slowly collect information about that user, which I then verify through other uh, mechanisms so I have a, a verified identity because once I have a verified or proof identity, that is information that is valuable to the business to me. I now know something more about that user that I can now begin to generate marketing or other uh, programs against that user because I know their interests and their actual preferences. And that, um, that that becomes really challenging to do at scale, but that's really kind of the goal here, and that's where you know having some uh, adaptive access control or, or other IAM offerings becomes very helpful in helping you kind of realize that goal. That was the extent of my uh, portion here. Um, I know we'll have time for some Q&A, but uh, at this point I'll turn it back over to Robert from Secure Auth. We'll kind of walk you through the Secure Auth offering, and then we'll uh, close out some Q&A. Robert? Great. Thanks, Mary. So not to be completely repetitive, but I'm sure I'll cover some of the same ground a little bit because I, I think it's important to set up um, what has changed with our views relevant to security for consumer portals and what that means. And obviously, Secure Auth has been in the, in the security business from an authentication perspective for more than 10 years. Uh, but over the last two or three years, we've really recentered around preventing the misuse of credentials. So not just being a two-factor company or not just being an SSO company, um, but more importantly, using adaptive authentication or intelligence-based authentication to help make two-factor a more secure mechanism, to help make single sign-on a more secure mechanism, to help bring those to internal employees. And what we found as we were doing that over the last year in particular is Organizations started asking for just as much protection on the consumer side, given how we were deploying adaptive to help on the employee side. And so I'll cover some of what we discovered in our last sort of year and a half journey in, in putting adaptive authentication to front of portals. And first and foremost, what we run into is one portal, two masters. Right? So we have traditionally been selling into the security side of organizations, but now as they start to say, listen, I'm being asked to help secure the portal, but, but when they start to have that conversation, it, it's more now from a sales, marketing, brand loyalty, true business perspective. And you can see through this slide that what we hear is those bullets are different. Those needs and desires, those fears and concerns are different. And so we had to make sure that whatever we brought to the market would allow us to serve both masters, would allow us to give security some feeling that they could increase security, but at the same time give marketing the same amount or sales or the business, if you will, the same amount of understanding that the positive user experience was going to trump all. The next problem, if you will, that we ran into is sort of one credential with two sides of the problem. So if we know that by and large passwords are the primary mechanism for authentication, particularly from the consumer side, endpoint in, organizationally, you're more vulnerable than ever before. And I think Merrick mentioned it relative to even when you, now that you store more data because you're doing more with your consumers, you're trying to engage more with your consumers, the more PII-like data you store, the more at risk you are because the more you are apt to be attacked based on 
uh, people wanting to be, you know, attackers wanting to be able to get at that data. So what we've learned in talking to our customers is you're, you're in a greater position of vulnerability because, as you can see here, the average person uses a small amount of passwords across a large amount of web accounts. And so there's this password hygiene or password replay perspective that, you know, in the identity industry, you know, we taught that for a long time, reduced sign-on. Uh, we taught password synchronization as a strategy to stop burning your end users. We're almost flipping that equation and saying, sorry, I think we got that one wrong. Now that we've pushed this synchronized password to 25 sites, now that we've reduced the sign-on to Active Directory to uh, 25 of our sites down to this one credential, whoops, we've created this instance where if they can get that first password, which is pretty easy to get in a lot of cases, unfortunately, I now have given them access to multiple endpoints within my organization. So we have the vulnerability side saying, or the, the, you know, the organizational side saying, hey, I'm more vulnerable than ever before because of how passwords are being managed. And uh, on the consumer side, they're saying, hey, wait, this idea of a password in general is, is aggravating and frustrating. And I will be the first to admit until I deployed other pieces of technology for myself to eliminate or alleviate the password burden, um, I often used forgot my password as my second factor of authentication. And I, I lost count at how many digital accounts I have in the world today, and, and I probably only run into some of them on a quarterly basis or a bi-monthly basis, and those passwords are long and forgotten because I have tried to be a very – stingy, stringent security steward and not using the same password, or at least I felt like I couldn't give advice not to if I wasn't taking that medicine myself. So so from an incorrect entry perspective, almost two-thirds of authentication failures happen because of forgotten passwords or, you know, some inaccurate response to a KBA-based question and trying to reset that password. So that single credential is creating plague-like problems both on the consumer side and on the organizational side. Worse, from a consumer perspective, is real commerce around those credentials. You know, this was taken uh, in 2016. There was a study done where they were um, understanding, not only are they really after the organizational PII, but what are your consumer details worth on the black market or the dark web or whatever cool name you want to give it relative to where people place things for sale. And so this is some understanding that, if I can get a hold of your social media account, if I can get a hold of your online retailer credentials, if I can get a hold of your your wallets, your bank account information, if I can get credit cards created in your name, I can generate income as an attacker. And I can do it because it's, it's being perched at, at, at a scale that's pretty economic from a pricing perspective. So all of that drives us to wanting to deliver stronger security. But as you heard us talk about, right, it's brand loyalty and consumer loyalty and consumer awareness drive the conversations when it's focused on the consumer portal. So here's the, the biggest challenges with driving that strong security. You know, it's really that breaches continue to rise based on credentials. That when we, you know, when a, when a survey was done around top 10 passwords still used, uh, it, it's, it's amazing to me that, that that could possibly still be accurate. But if you can believe keepsecurity.com, then, uh, let, let's pretend that's true. I just can't imagine anyone's using 1111111 still as a password. But nonetheless, <clears throat> we did our own study where we talked to more than 250 customers uh, around passwords being reused from a replay perspective. The M Trends data report tells us about hackers, or sorry, attackers, and how long they go undetected within environments. And then we know from our own consumer base that, that two factor alone is just not enough protection. Uh, relevant to what it does from a user experience perspective. Speaking of the user experience, we know on the consumer side, and, and Merritt touched on a number of these, right, the, the longer the enrollment process is, the more dissatisfied that consumer is to, to the initial deny, the desire to connect uh, with you from an from a organizational perspective the more maintenance placed on them from a password or authentication perspective, the least likely they are to continue to drive and connect with you from a loyalty perspective. They require mm, pain-free movement across applications. Most consumer sites nowadays are some conglomeration of merged or acquired businesses. And so the more pain-free you can make the movement between those applications, 
to me as a consumer, the more attractive that is, the more I desire to remain more loyal with you. And then also, if I have to contact the support desk, it would be to give me multiple ways to do so and the ability to make that not take uh, a long time. Um, ultimately helps me have this uh, frictionless or better disruptionless user experience. Back to the survey we did earlier, you know, 86% of surveyed adults said they'd use two-factor authentication if an online account made that option available. And I think it's, an, it's important to understand that while although they say that, the how in that, in that percentage I, I think is really the determining factor. You know, I'll use myself as an example. I won't throw my bank under the bus. God forbid they'd be on this webinar, for instance. Uh, but when I have a web-based experience with my bank, go to URL, type enter, username, password presented, about 90% of the time I'm second factor authenticate requested. And it's typically because I live on the road. Uh, I'm gone every week in my customer spaces, uh, speaking engagements, et cetera. And obviously one of the policy settings they have is must be uh, a device location or, or no network. <clears throat> and so I'm always sort of probably violating that rule and then so the second factor is there. So my user experience is poor. Even though I'm happy that they've offered it to me, I don't like having to have it every single time I authenticate because I want to do something from a banking perspective. Whereby on my mobile app or their mobile app that I use on my mobile device is very frictionless. I touch ID, authenticate to it because I've given it the password. It only requires me to re-give it a password every 90 days. Otherwise, it takes the touch ID as the acceptable authentication. It doesn't care where my mobile device is. As long as I have the device and the device can match my touch ID, uh, voila, I'm in. Frictionless as possible. So guess what I do about 99.999% of my banking directly on my mobile app, right? So I didn't choose to go away from my bank, per se, because they've given me at least one experience that I find to be very disruptionless. Uh, had they decided to take that same approach that maybe on both the native app as well as the web application, I probably would have moved my business to uh, the bank down the street because I want to find a way to feel like I have greater security but also have as much frictionless experience as possible. Speaking of my mobile device, the more we move things to mobility or mobile devices, the more we trust or try to use SMS as that verified second factor for authentication because we know it's the easiest way to reach consumers. Um, we know as a business you're not going to ask a consumer, hey, by the way, I only going to accept push to accept as a second factor, so please download our third-party solution provider for two-factor authentication, their application, so I can push to accept to you. We know that's not going to happen. <clears throat> we also know NIST is saying, though, that SMS is a vulnerable protocol to, to use for second-factor authentication. And this infographic indicates exactly why. Um, if you don't believe the data that's here around the different ways to exploit through SMS interception or SIM cloning or SMS swapping, um, just go to YouTube and type those same words in and watch the videos on how fast folks can convert and clone a phone and how unbeknownst to you SMS interception can be happening. So. We at SecureAuth felt like if we were going to advocate for the increased usage of mobile devices as a second factor for authentication, we had to also add in ways that we could help organizations ascertain device reputation, phone number reputation, without further impact that end user process, going back to the, the, the two masters relevant to security uh, as well as the, the business itself. And so I'll talk through that here in just a second. So what's the cost if you don't address all three? Essentially, what's the cost if you don't address increased security, if you don't address end user experience, and if you don't address mobility um, awareness of, of what to do from a mobility perspective? Just looking at some of the examples, again, from different studies, not ours. You know, $4 million is what a breach on average costs an organization. Then you can see what some of the top targets paid out based on their breaches. Average cost of a stolen record, up to $355. Brand erosion, customer erosion by seeking different alternatives. And the help desk costs for passwords are, are significant, particularly if you still today outsource a, a help desk from a call cost perspective. So how does SecureAuth help? How do we put this thing I talked about as adaptive authentication to work? How do we take a different approach than what we feel many in the market take today 
around increasing security and at the same time increasing user experience, or at least protecting user experience from friction whenever possible. We do it in three areas, but with the same technology on the back end. So as you can see on the right, uh, and these aren't meant to be like layers one through N, uh, they're just here layered from a graphic perspective. But as you can see on the right, there's numerous layers we use in what we call our adaptive stack or our adaptive engine. And then they're applied from a consumer scenario in three different areas. First, that registration, validating identity being onboarded without having to rely exclusively on a third party for identity proofing. All right, we can we can do things during the registration process um, by understanding what's happening at the device, by understanding where it's coming from from a threat service perspective, by looking at different geo information around uh, its network, or sorry, around its geography, not just network, during the registration process to help you determine, is there enough here that I can trust this registration to continue? And then obviously from an authentication perspective, we can do all these all these layers and, and, and same understanding to help you determine based on risk, should I accept a single username and password credential? Should I apply some degree of friction? Or should I just outright deny altogether? And more important in that conversation, if I decide to apply a second degree of friction, what kind of control do I give to the end users around that factor? Do I allow them to choose which factor to present? Do I decide which factor to present? And if I use something like SMS, how can I leverage other layers in our adaptive stack, like phone fraud prevention, to understand if that number has recently been ported or cloned prior to sending the SMS text to that device? Or do I have an integration with that organization's, um, you know, if I'm talking more from a BD perspective, do I have an integration with that, with that organization's EMM solution to help interrogate those devices as well? But on the consumer side, just getting carrier data as part of our adaptive layer to understand if that phone number itself has recently been moved. And then back to that continual evalu evaluation or, or the third leg of, of putting adaptive to work for consumers, also they're going to have to manage that password. They're going to have forgotten that password and need to reset that password. So to discern between a password reset from a standard user and a password reset from a suspicious or worse malicious user, Using these same layers of adaptive to look at, are they coming from a known device when they're attempting that password reset? Are they coming from a non-transparent browser when they're attempting that password reset? Are they coming from an IP address that has a, a good reputation? Are they coming from a known ge geography that we would expect them to come from, um, that they've came from in the past when they're trying to submit for that password reset? Or should I, because they aren't, should I insert ourselves and, and prevent that pass recess or, or ask for a second factor of authentication prior to allowing the pass reset to occur? So bringing that, 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 that model of two-factor authentication, but also bringing it to the maintenance phase of someone managing their password allows us to further qualify that pass reset request um, and discern it from suspicious or malicious behavior. So ultimately what I'm saying relative to adaptive authentication is using those layers of analysis to help provide the greatest possible protection from a security perspective, but at the same time really focusing on the least amount of friction possible from a usability, right? So the protection the organization needs and the usability users want. And what I really mean by usability, and, and I hope that, that you guys have seen this more in your own lives as consumers, you know, we don't mandate any certain factor for authentication. In fact, you know, when I have to second factor authenticate to secure off myself, um, I am presented, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the different ways that I have currently registered. So I could do push to accept because I have an authenticate app. I can do symbol to accept because I have an authenticate app. I can do SMS, I can do email, I can do email link, I can do SMS link, I can do SMS code. Um, all of those are available to me because I have registered for them. Consumers want greater control. So knowing that you can offer to them the ability to choose SMS and or email and or push to accept delivered maybe even through your own native app so that you're not having to have a secondary application um, allows them to feel like they have more control over um, how they're accepting that second factor when friction is required. 
So again, back to greatest protection and greatest user experience at the same time. So, I mean, for the purpose of this webinar, I, I wanted to give a high level overview of kind of what we were seeing, particular to our customers, and what we were being told and what we're seeing in the market that helped us drive toward this idea of using adaptive. We've been using it for years now on the enterprise side, uh, but converting that conversation and using it now on the consumer side and why. So hopefully I, I gave some good data there from an overview perspective. So now we will open it up to questions. So let's go see what questions we have in the Q&A panel so far. All right, so I have a question. Do you have any data that represents how often users are second factor authenticated based on adaptive authentication? So the answer is yes. Uh, we started that this year. Um, the data sample we have is, is our collective user base. So I don't have a way to say how much consumer traffic versus enterprise traffic versus B2B traffic. But I can say that from January 1st till uh, October 30th, um, which is the data sample we've most recently encapsulated, uh, we have all of our authentication traffic and what's been done with that traffic. Um, and so I can tell you that we've gone through 617 million authentications across 4 million users, and 88% of that traffic was successfully accepted uh, based on adaptive authentication with one single factor of authentication. Now there's further numbers that break down what happened with the remaining 12%. Um, of the 12%, a lot of it was bad, re bad password denials. 4% of that 12% was actual step up authentication. And then inside that was even a smaller percentage of those that, that were stepped up and successfully passed versus stepped up and abandoned versus stepped up and gave wrong factor um, during step up. And by and large, what we've learned from looking at that across our own data set, which is around 600 customers uh, over that 10 or 11 month period of time, is that what we're really understanding is that adaptive allows you to continue to control the end user experience in a positive way. And at the same time, increased security because of all the analysis happening um, on the end user traffic itself. So I hope that answered that question. I do not see any other questions. So at this point, I would like to thank you for your time and let you know those of you who registered um, and attended, uh, you'll get a um, digital copy of the slides and the um, recorded presentation. So again, thank you for your time today. Thank you as well. Take care.